the ancestral homelands of the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations, who are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. I say this knowing that acknowledgement is only the bare minimum. The place that is now called the United States is rooted in violence against Black and Indigenous people, and it continues today. Our job is to speak honestly about it and remember that speaking is not enough. I'd also like to acknowledge we are having this conversation on the anniversary of a night in 2015 when racist violence took nine lives from us in Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Let us now take a moment to remember those who lost their lives that night. The Reverend Clementa Pinckney, Cynthia Hurd, the Reverend Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Taiwanza Sanders, Ethel Lance, Susie Jackson, DePayne Middleton Doctor, the Reverend Daniel Simmons, and Myra Thompson. Let's observe a moment of silence for those brave souls. Thank you. Our conversation tonight is not about what white supremacy has destroyed, but the opposite. What have communities of color around this country done to combat white supremacist symbols since 2015? And what still remains to be done? I'm joined by an illustrious panel, and I do mean illustrious. First, we have Bree Newsom Bass, an artist, filmmaker, and organizer who many of you know as the one who took the flag down when lawmakers were not taking action in South Carolina. Lisa Brooks, Chief of Staff of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and CJ Hunt, the director of The Neutral Ground, a film about memory, monuments, and how to break up with the Confederacy, which is also being shown on POV this season. Bree, I'd like to start with you. As people write the narrative of how the flag came down in South Carolina, I think some people forget. It didn't come down because of the moral leadership of lawmakers. You had to go up there and pull it down. And also some forget that many of those lawmakers, including Governor Haley, later reversed their support of that removal. As an activist who largely ignited this movement, what do you think it's important for us to remember about Charleston in the summer of 2015? Yes, and um, thank you so much for having me be a part of this important conversation. You know, I think that what happened in 2015 and this kind of ongoing conversation about historical remembrance as well as historical revisionism, uh, really in a way, is a common pattern throughout our history. So, so the situation in Charleston is just one example of that. I mean, even the framing of of the confederate flag coming down around this idea that it wasn't a point of controversy in south carolina until the shootings that was something that we we heard during that time too where people were like oh well no one was really making a big deal of this until we saw the photos of dylan roof you know holding the confederate flag and of course that is blatantly untrue uh, the flag was raised in the 60s at the height of the civil rights movement everyone always understood it to be uh, and, and a sign of opposition to civil rights. People had protested and boycotted for years. They finally moved the flag from the dome of the Capitol in the year 2000. And that's when they passed the law saying that it couldn't be lowered for any reason unless there was a two thirds approval in the state house. So that was like the whole context that led to the situation where we had this horrific event in Charleston and they lower the you know United States flag to have staff, but the Confederate flag is still at the top of the pole and just creating this kind of horrific optic that, you know, matches the, the policies and social practices of racism. It just reflects how racism is baked into the structures. Uh, and then the continued kind of denialism around it, you know, the, the fact that uh, Nikki Haley, who was governor at the time, supported the flag being up then you know kind of came out in support of it coming down when it was politically the more salient thing to do and then when she felt like it was in her political interest to switch positions she did that again uh, so it's important that we remember all of these things including how change actually happens because that's often part of what gets uh, written out of the historical memory 
Thank you. It's it's a very good point. How does change actually happen? And thank you for making that change happen, Bree. And Licia, how did the uh, events of that summer affect the work that SPLC was doing? It's me. Oh, there we go. Thank you for having me on. And thank you, Bree, for, you know, setting the stage and tell, telling the truth in that way. The Southern Poverty Law Center um, was inspired by what you um, did and what activists on the ground have been doing for some years. As you say, it didn't start in 2015. And there have been activists across the Deep South that have been, been fighting to take down these monuments, you know, for decades. So just to be clear. In the aftermath of that massacre six years ago today in Charleston, the Southern Poverty Law Center, we track and monitor hate and extremist groups and notice that that the murderer had a particular fetishization of Confederate memorabilia. And most people will remember, as you recall, Brie, the, the, the picture of him with a Confederate flag in one hand and a gun in another. And that coupled with his own kind of confession and manifesto around what radicalized him, how he became, how he came into white nationalism and came to support white supremacy. All of these things came together for um, people who refused to look at the, the, the Confederate monuments and the Confederate flags as symbols of white supremacy until an avowed, self-avowed white supremacist tells them that this is this is what's going on. So let's let, let's just be clear about that. The Southern Poverty Law Center wanted to see um, how many of these these symbols of white supremacy existed in public space, because it became very clear when you took down that flag that that this was this was public space. I remember kind of the, the everything surrounding it and how people kind of like claimed the space. So we started a campaign originally called Erasing Hate and expected to find, you know, any number of, of, of symbols across the Deep South. But what we found was that these, these symbols of, of white supremacy, these, these symbols to the Confederacy are in fact littered across this entire nation. And as you say, um, they, they were erected to assert and reassert white supremacy. Our research showed, and I think shows pretty clearly, that these monuments were not erected to um, pay reverence to the war dead, but in fact to, to push back against um, newly emancipated African Americans who, who bought into the notion of um, reconstruction. Um, and then that kind of fell apart, and Jim Crow, the Jim Crow era began. And the white supremacists thought to put up these monuments to remind them that white supremacy was still the law of the land and that that white supremacy and, and black inferiority reigned. And so they, they purposely placed them in courthouses, uh, in the front of courthouses and in town, in town squares and, um, you know, at the state house building. So all of this is is purposeful and intentional and and a part of an organized propaganda campaign led by white women. But there's a lot to talk about that. It just starts. Led, led by white yeah, women. That's a whole other thing. I'm not going to get into it, but no, it's led by white women. You know, you know. So much there. There's just like so much there that, as you said, that reflected the day, right? So it's just, it's an object lesson in, in how white supremacy plays out in the United States. I'll stop there. And I just want to say, since Bree climbed that flagpole, four South Carolina schools are pending a rename. However, zero Confederate symbols have been removed from public property in South Carolina. So CJ, going to you, your film begins just a few months later in New Orleans City Council in December of 2015. What inspired you to start filming? Thanks. Um, I just got to say what an honor it is to be here with you all and, and specifically Brie and Leisha. I think, I think it is incredible to, to be in conversation with you because 
you provided something so essential to all of us. You know, I, I think I think it is about spaces where we can imagine action and where we can imagine freedom, right? So people knew and and folks have tried to displace Confederate symbols before, but there's something about seeing Brie up on a flagpole that I think for a lot of us was like, oh, we can just do it. Like we're not we're not waiting for city council or petitioning or writing an op-ed. It's just like models of change once you see it. And then we saw the same thing after Charlottesville with places like UNC and Durham pulling down statues. But once you see it, you're like, oh, we can just do that. So the ability to imagine action and then SPLC, you know, your, what you did with, with showing us the scope of the problem, you know, folks know that these things are everywhere and know the, the ones that exist in their communities. But to see SPLC come out and say, you know, there are 1700 uh, just to the Confederacy, just that we know about. So for me in 2015, I was in New Orleans. It's the longest place I've lived um, anywhere. Uh, and I moved there in 2007 as a teacher. And by 2015, I was doing a lot of comedy and I was watching what was unfolding in Charleston. And for me, comedy is kind of just how I process the things that make me really furious. You know, some people go journal and some people write a think piece on medium.com, shout out to medium.com. Um, but me, when I get, when I get heated, I, I try to write comedy that is roasting the thing that I think is being disingenuous uh, or intellectually lazy, or just or just straight up lying. So people forget, they want to claim Bree's victory and be like, you know what, the massacre happened and then we just knew it was clear. It was not clear. There were Republicans wringing their hands even after Bree pulled that flag down about our heritage and what will it mean and what happens to history. So the first piece I ever got published was roasting those lawmakers and then as that conversation moved to New Orleans and our white mayor, Mitch Landrew, took his cues from the organizers uh, like Take Em Down Nola and Marie Galatis and, you know, the legacy of Avery Alexander, of, of Black New Orleanians saying, these don't belong here. Robert E. Lee does not belong in the highest place of honor in the city. When Mitch Landrew and the city council started putting that into motion, I knew that there were going to be people being like, oh, no, if you move a statue across town, it destroys history. And so I started filming to be like, let me roast that. Let, it, let us capture on film the absurdity of, of how hard people grip to 130-year-old statues of slave owners. Thanks, CJ. Uh First, I want to do a fact check. Uh, Bree, let me know that the Calhoun statue was removed in Charleston, the only one that she knows of. So one statue has been taken down since 2015. And I also want to fast forward to August of 2017. Four Confederate monuments were removed in New Orleans that spring, but by August, white supremacists were rallying to defend a Robert E. Lee monument in Charlottesville, Virginia, which I'm sure we all remember. Bree, what did the events of Charlottesville mean to you? That hit in a particular way because I had actually had the fortune of connecting with the community in Charlottesville that mobilized around getting that statue removed, um, including uh, one of the students, Diana Bryant, who really kind of led that whole effort. And what was interesting about the Charlottesville situation is it was kind of the reverse, right? So in Charlottesville, you had a community that said, we want to remove the statue. They got the city government to sign off of it. And then like all of these Nazis descended on the city basically to, to prevent them from, from taking it down. So you had kind of like, one or the other happening. Uh, like for instance, here in Durham, North Carolina, there was a situation where the um, state legislature actually passed a law to, to take away local power in removing monuments, right? Um, but then in other places, people really uh, mobilized around doing it. And that was the case in Charlottesville. And so it wasn't really surprising, even though it was still obviously very shocking. Um, to see the response that, that monuments kind of emerged as the proxy war essentially 
for, for this struggle over ideological white supremacy. Because of course, it's not just about the monuments, right? But it's about upholding the ideology, upholding the structure. And everyone knows that the monuments were put in place, as was said, as a way of, of sending the message that white supremacy is the order of the day here. So as they start to come down, of course, people see that as an indication of the dismantling, the gradual dismantling of white supremacy. And so that's why it played out in the way that it did in Charlottesville. Thanks, Bree. And CJ, Bree says something interesting, which is that it's not about the monuments. And as you were making the film, living through the film, uh, did the story that you thought you were telling about the monuments coming down change, or was it really verified for you? I mean, I agree. It, it, it sounds very simple, but it, it, it is not. It is about white supremacy. Like most of these folks don't know a ton about the monuments. It is a, it's just a way, you know, it is a, it is a container for white supremacy. It is a horcrux, if you will, for Harry Potter fans for that white supremacy can live in, in order to live on. So, you know, one of the first surprises, and this sounds naive now, but you know, I grew up in, in Boston and New York, so I was familiar with the idea that there is a different story told by some white Southerners about this war. But I was not prepared for the most common thing people will say once you spend any amount of time past states' rights is they will say to your face, slavery was not that bad. You know, like that is the that is the base of it, you know, the, the top arguments are, well, you know, political correctness, and if you destroy history, and well, who knows, and Robert E. Lee, you know, he freed us. But then, you know, you get five, 10 minutes into it, it's slavery is not that bad. And when you realize that that is what you are dealing with, um, it won, you know, it, it, it shows the lie of the whole, it's not about slavery argument. It's like, okay, well, why do you keep talking about slavery? That's like saying, oh, my, you know, my marriage did not end because of cheating. But on a separate note, you know, cheating is not that bad. It's like, if it's not about that, why do you obsess about defending this thing over and over again? Like, if it's not about it, I don't need to know that slavery was not that bad. What are we even talking about? But for me as a filmmaker, you know, I went in with a note on my board that said to myself, um, to make them see. And I think a lot of my process in the beginning, and I think folks who spend time digging up receipts may recognize this struggle. You, there is a moment, there is a time where you think, okay, if I can only find enough evidence, right? If I can only find the insanely racist speech uh, at the UNC dedication, or if I can only show how the white league members who attacked the city government in New Orleans and stormed the state house were then promoted to the mayor and the state Supreme Court. And those two are the ones who speak at the Lee dedication. You know, I, I was a detective thinking if we can find the evidence, we can convince folks who will grip onto white supremacy that this is white supremacy. But then there's a moment in the filmmaking where you're like, it is not about them. They will never let go of that story because that story is part of their identity. And the job is, and I replaced it with a card that says to see ourselves that this is not about convincing bigots. And arguably, I don't know about the people on the fence, but I think this is about saying the truth out loud in public in ways that allow people to take action like Brie, to take action like Do It Like Durham, to take action like folks pulling down McDonough in New Orleans last June around this time. So, you know, that's a bit about the white gaze, but I think it, it is not about us making a case to whiteness as to why we deserve to put their stuff away. <laughs> I think that's an incredible point, CJ. I grew up in Mississippi in the 80s, and not only did I often hear that slavery wasn't that bad, but that many Black people were better off as slaves than they are today because they were taken care of. So. These it's, things sound just misinformed and wild, but these are the things that the United Daughters of the Confederacy wrote down. These are the things that the UDC through their catechism taught to children. So all the things when we hear them and we're like, that's dumb. 
It's like, no, that's just propaganda. Well written over the years. And institutionalized in school books and in classes and in our history, many big lies. And a lot of them were really personified, I think, in the monuments. And Leisha, I wanna go to the Who's Heritage Project for a minute where you track the construction, locations and removal of Confederate monuments. What changes have you seen in the data after Charlottesville? Well, one thing I wanna add is that, that we know monuments, statues, parks, school names, street names, military installations. And I mentioned that because it's not, it, 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 as we've said, it's not just about the monuments, but that message about white, white supremacy is reinforced through all of these things in public life, right? So, so in Montgomery, Alabama, you have you know 99% African American student body attending Robert E. Lee School High School, around you know or just around the corner from Jeff Davis Drive, right? And so, kind of all of this reinforcement that's happening is a part of that propaganda campaign that CJ was that CJ was talking about. Um, what we've seen when the when our first report was released in 2016, we we identified about 1,500 symbols, and then we invited people on the ground who who knew better than us to t tell us more, give us more information. So by the second edition, after 2017, um, and the events, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, it had gone up to about 1,700. And now we're close to 2,000. So even as we remove um, these symbols from public space, community members are uncovering even more. So, and that's not to take away, I totally take your point. I love the idea of um, that it's not about convincing, but it's about kind of reclaiming and claiming. And that is certainly happening. And I also enjoy, you know, sharing the receipts or having the information because I'm, I'm happy to have the conversation because some correction needs to be made to the record, right? Um, I think it's important to note that it wasn't just um, the UDC or, you know, the former Confederate states that pushed out this lost cause narrative, but it was also and remained supported by, you know, those on the North. I mean, you show that really well in your film. CJ, I'm like, yeah, that's right. All of this, all of this thing happened at post-Civil War, this coming together of the former Confederate states with the Union. Um, they, in fact, allowed them to place these monuments and these statues outside of the South, right? As a way to reunify the nation. You say in your film so brilliantly, it's like, it wasn't a, it was a, what would you, a reconciliation between the white men on both sides. Right. So nothing to do again with us. So I think that I think that um, I'm encouraged by over 300 monuments coming down since 2015. Um, and it's important to note since the you know public lynching of Mr. George Floyd, that uh, 169 of those were, were, were May 2020 to this date. And that's like. That's four times as many as 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 was true in the in those four years combined before. So I don't know. I I, I we need to do more. Um, it shouldn't have to come after a massacre. It shouldn't have to come after a Nazi rally. It shouldn't have to come after a public lynching. We should we should be able to do that. I want to just shout out the state of Virginia that um, they've done really, really, really hard work and, and made some tremendous gains. They overturned their preservation laws. That's another thing to talk about. After Bree, you know, scaled the, the, the flagpole, that scared Southern, Southern legislators across the South. And they immediately began to implement um, heritage preservation laws that were written specifically to prevent community members from taking down monuments and statues. In Alabama, 
it's a it, it, you'll be fine. It's a twenty five thousand dollar fine if you even like try to do something. Um, and then post George Floyd, people are like, I don't care. It's coming down. We'll take care. We'll take care of that bill later. <laughs> so there's a there's it, it's it's both and it's encouraging. Um, and it just reminds us that there's just a lot more to do. Alicia, you mentioned the public killing of George Floyd, and I appreciate your saying that because one thing I think that many people either forget, don't want to acknowledge, or don't realize is that what happened to George Floyd happens every day in America. This just happened to be on tape. And I want to talk a little bit about that as a turning point, too, in how we look at things. As you said, more more monuments came down after that. But I'd be curious to hear from each of you. Let's start with you, Bree, about what you see changing in this nation since George Floyd's murder in the summer of 2020. I honestly feel like the greatest change is people recognizing that they can't look away. And when I say people, I, I really mean even more specifically like the power establishment, um, even like white moderates and liberals who were hoping that we didn't really have to touch structures, right? Like if we could just do cosmetic things like diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter Day, put up a banner, wear a t-shirt, that kind of thing. Um, I think that the the George Floyd moment, what it did was to put out there in a way that no one could deny just how blatant racism is, how entrenched it is in our structures. And I think particularly with the George Floyd case, the fact was that this was recorded. Like you said, this was not only happened in public because even it happening in public wasn't enough. It had to be recorded in order to challenge the original police narrative that was put out. So had this not been documented, there's a chance that we either would have not known about the George Floyd case or there would be kind of like this back and forth between what the police claimed happened and what the witnesses uh, you know, said happened. And so my only... I don't want to say concern necessarily, but something I think that we have to be so vigilant about is that this effort to remove monuments or this question around like, okay, we take a monument down, then who should we make a monument to? I saw where they just unveiled a monument to George Floyd, actually, in New Jersey. My, my, my only concern and what I think we have to be vigilant about is that that doesn't become the substitute for, for doing the actual work around dismantling racism. Because what I've seen and have, having been involved in this movement now since about 2012, 2013, is that people will constantly go up to the line, but then we, when we actually start hitting on the things that actually need to change, and we say, we've got to address housing, we've got to address voting rights, we've got to change police and all of these things, that's where the line stops. And we'll do absolutely everything <laughs> besides that. So, so it's like we got to this moment, you know, George Floyd is five years after the events in South Carolina. And now there's this breakthrough, you know, revelation around the need for monuments to come down. So I'm glad to see them come down, but I also kind of feel like, that's the that's kind of like the compromise position of like, OK, fine, we'll take monuments down. Now will you stop talking about policing? And that's why I'm not willing to just accept the monuments coming down and or, or you know, like kind of uh, symbolic gestures as some kind of substitute for actually dismantling structural racism. And CJ, I'm curious to hear what you've seen change. You've been studying this so intensely and what do you feel has been the shift in our country i'm just absorbing Bree's point right now i mean uh I, I know this might sound naive but yeah i am used to thinking about the um the compromises that were made you know in the civil rights era of okay this is about just civil rights and we're not going to take it any farther than that you know like now you're talking about the poor people's campaign or you're talking about vietnam we don't want anything to do with you anymore martin luther king like you know and i am really uh empowered by what is happening with monuments because it is it becomes such a clear language for other things but but i do take the point and it is a nice challenge that Bree is, is putting that there is a way that the, the way that the narrative celebrates takedowns in certain places is 
can be a a uh, a substitute for actually dismantling of you know uh, of 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 what is uh, of violence that is happening to black and brown people every day. That so I am absorbing that, and I am thinking about um, you know one thing that one thing that I thought was really incredible to watch. I mean, just the numbers that Leisha gave, you know, it's been three plus 300 have come down in the past six years, right? So, you know, how do we conceptualize of that? Is that a lot? Is that great? Is that embarrassingly few? And then when you put that up against the idea that half of that number came down in the past year, I think that that is really inspiring. You know, I, you know, when I look at the number of uh, 2,000 or left, and I'm like, okay, well, we did half the number. You know, like, we, we can run this fast as we've done in the past year. And what I think is also inspiring is that, you know, you started seeing it. The first time I noticed it was when Alexandria took down one of their monuments and just gave it to the UDC. But there's a domino effect of a lot of those takedowns are cities taking down their own monuments because they are like, if we don't move this, the people will move this. Um, and I, I had not expected that type of domino effect. And it, it is inspiring to see sort of white power structures recognize that like, huh, people have kind of figured out that these are in public place and these will not be allowed to be in public place uncontested. And that feels like a, new norm um which which i think is 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 really notable leisha i i'm curious to hear what you think about whether or not this will last i mean Bree makes a good point about how this is not enough but we're gaining momentum and cj mentioned just you know how it's heartening to hear that people are starting to realize that this is not okay do you think that we are in a moment that is going to continue to snowball and grow, or do you think it will fizzle? Well, I think that's up to us. And, and the way you open the meeting saying that um, it's not really about them coming down or, you know, kind of if, if governments agree to take them down, it's more about the, us, the people on the ground who, who are motivated and encouraged to continue to do the hard work of dismantling white supremacy. It, they're, they're never going to do it, right? It's, it's like we have to do it and show them that it has to be done. And I take your point too, Brie, around kind of coming up to the edge. And and yet I'm encouraged, as I'm, sh as I'm sure you are too, by how, how powerful these wins are for activists who have been trying to, to, to create some change all these years. We just worked with a group in Jacksonville, Florida, who who got the school board to change the names of, I think it was five or six schools. They wanted nine, they got six. I mean, this is a group of people who have been, you know, ignored and marginalized in that community and in that school district who now feel like, wow, we did that. And, and I'm encouraged that that will lead them to do more, you know. Yes. Imagine yes. graduating and being like our graduation gift, your school's not no longer named after Robert E. Lee. Yeah. And and I just want to clarify real quick that I do think it is enormously powerful. Like it's a good sign. You know, one of the things that I often say to people is there's no future America where we have dismantled racism and we still have monuments to the Confederacy, right? So the fact that they are coming down is always a good sign. And I do think that it's really powerful in that it's helping people make these connections, right? So if you have a state that says, we're going to fine you $25,000 for touching the statue, people start to put in their mind, okay, wait a second. You're putting more money and effort and legal protection around the statue than you are around people. And from that, everybody is able to like deepen their analysis around these systems. And so my hope is that like as we take the monuments down, that people are then pushing for deeper systemic change because it helps them in informing that analysis. I, I think it concretizes, it, it literally makes concrete what we have been trying to say. You know, I, I think that there needs to be a museum exhibit. No one take this idea. But I think that there needs to be a museum exhibit. I think historians will long study 
the many photos from 2020 of large circles of cops protecting monuments to slavers while people in the streets ask for their protection. You know, it concretizes what we are talking about. People in the streets are going, people over property, please protect people and not property. And cops are saying, please step away from the statue. You know, like, like it, it, it makes it so undeniable and so concrete. And I think, you know, you see incredible gains like what we can do when we connect those dots. So the same organizers in New Orleans who were moving to take down those monuments and got those monuments down are now in league with the People's Assembly trying to make the connection that there are other monuments to white supremacy that are not made of stone. And one of those is a housing complex called Gordon Plaza that is uh, an all black community that was built on a toxic waste Superfund site. So for them, the connection that they are making and are waiting for the mayor to get behind them now is if you can acknowledge that racism is built into our community in a statue of a man like this, can you also acknowledge that it is built into our community via where housing goes and who lives there? And so I am also hopeful that if we can use statues to make concrete what feels ephemeral about white supremacy, that, that making the case is, is helpful only if we can then translate it into something else. I appreciate that point too, because I think what I saw was people, be, this gave them a concrete example of, oh, this is anti-black racism, because this is targeting, you know, black folk and, and white people who, who couldn't see it before, all of a sudden, like, oh, I get it, because we've been putting the, 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 the blocks or the information together for them to, to get it, right? Again, it's not about trying to convince them, but when when um, more people are able to recognize um, the foundations of white supremacy, then you know we'll be able to dismantle and disrupt that system for good. Lots of people don't even recognize it at all, even though it's, it's clear to us. And I'd say, and I hope that one of the measures of success of this movement is how hard they're coming at us with this nonsense about critical race theory. They wouldn't be talking about it if communities across the country weren't being successful at saying the truth out loud. Virginia has quietly been able to restructure their uh, educational standards and framework. And the framework now centers slavery as the cause of the war, right? Virginia hasn't been, you know, I feel like we've been getting a lot of, giving a lot of love to Virginia, but Virginia hasn't been like, look at us, we did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just just quietly moving on, telling the truth. And I, and I think that the, the opposition uh, lawmakers who have built their whole party on individual freedom and suspicion of government power and censorship are now using government power to curtail individual freedom of teachers. Like th that is nonsense, but I also think it is a measure of success of, of these different movements. And Leisha, one thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is the pedestals. Can you tell us how Southern Poverty Law Center is looking at the pedestals and what they represent and what should be done? One of the things that that we're we're learning, and you know, as we continue to kind of engage in this in this research, we learn how to be more accurate about what we're talking about. In the beginning, in 2016, we we would identify removals. Now we've we've come to recognize that if the just because the the the, the statue of, of Robert E. Lee on a horse was removed and the pedestal remained, then that's not a removal. So in the next edition of the Who's Heritage Report, we will note that that is still counted as a live monument or statue unless and until that 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 pedestal is removed. And we've also kind of changed our, our uh, not changed kind of the way I address it. It was important in the beginning to say, well, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center doesn't advocate for the destruction of, of these monuments. We just want them, you know, move them to, to public, to um, a museum or an archive and trying to be kind of approach it nice. We're not, I'm not nice about it anymore. Like they need to go. And, and as as we have the conversation here and globally, 
I think that the whole the whole topic of contested monuments and contested history, the only way to correct them is to remove them. They can't be recontextualized. I mean, we're open to a lot of different things, um, you know, in 2015 to 2016. But I can tell you today, the Southern Poverty Law Center advocates for complete removal. So that's where Thank we're at. We're, we down drop it into that. 32, so 32 uh, statutes that we had identified as removed are back on the list because their pedestals remain. And we're about to wrap up now, and I, I want to thank all of you for a discussion where I know I've learned a lot and I'm sure our audience has as well. But I, I'd just like to ask a last question of each of you, which is, What's next? What do you see as the most pressing issue that we need to address in this country to combat white supremacy? What would you urge people to do? We'll start with you, Bree. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I mean, I see, I feel like white supremacy describes the entire power construct and the entire organization of the society. And I think that's why it is difficult to address any one thing without having to address that whole thing. And that is playing out, you can pick any number of issues that are on the slate right now, whether it is voting, policing, housing, right? Clean air and water. All of those things touch on this issue of structural racism because that's what the whole system was designed around. And I think sometimes we forget how recent all of this history is. The fact that this land had chattel slavery far longer than it has had any kind of semblance of multiracial democracy that we're still kind of very early in that process. What I think is so powerful, again, around the monument issue uh, and, and, you know, this issue of public display of these symbols is their very public nature. So, you know, it, it's it's exactly correct that this um, kind of backlash that we're seeing right now and trying to attack curriculum and basically trying to make it illegal or certainly create a climate where people feel like it is illegal to teach on issues of slavery and racism is in reaction to the shifting ideology and these shifting attitudes. And so I think that you can't really address the structural issues until you can shift ideology. And so I would, I think that that's a starting point, you know, like I, I think that you have to shift consciousness. That was a major part of why I decided to scale the poll in that way, because I felt like it was important to kind of make that, that statement and kind of, you know, expand people's imaginations where people say, oh, wait a second, we can just take it down, right? Um, and so, you know, I would recommend if they try to outlaw teaching of slavery, hey, let's gather around the monument site. So let's gather around where the monuments used to be and let's have a public teach in. Uh, the more we can go public and, and, you know, educate people and shift the ideology, that has to happen. And that has to precede, just like the monuments have to coming down, precede the actual changing of the structures. That has to precede uh, the policy change that we're fighting for. I agree. I mean, I mean, I was going to say I agree 100%. I agree 100%. It's, it is the old paradigm in 2016 was, we've got to move these monuments. So let's go talk to some neo-Confederates. Here we are at the new, uh, here we're rolling news footage. And, but not everyone agrees that Robert E. Lee should come down. Cut to an old white man in a tweed blazer who points at it and goes, this is my ancestor. And I think we're done with that. We're d if you are making a news program, you don't need to put in the statement, but not everyone agrees this is slavery. Like, we don't need that. We don't need that perspective. You don't need to go talk to the white man in the blazer. We know what he's going to say. So I, I think there, were the, there was something not about, there was something about the mainstream paradigm in 2015 and 16, not necessarily everything organized were doing, but that felt as if we had to ask permission from the folks oppressing us if we could move their stuff. I think we are far past asking permission. And I think that spills over into schools, that it's not like, may we teach this? What do we think? What's the legislation? That, that there are hundreds of thousands of teachers out there who are excited for and thirsty for resources and history to teach their kids truth about America. And, I, and, and, it, and it's like a very effective way to say like, 
the people, the little boys in Charlottesville came from somewhere. They came from a school system that went there, you know? Uh, so, so I think that is, that is the battle that me and my movie team will be focusing on of how do we get the film in hands of educators? How do we uplift educators doing incredible things? And, and how do we um, help teach more truth out loud? I love, I love both of those ideas. And I, I just got like chills when you said like, let's gather around and have like a teaching. I, I would love to do that. Um, the threat though, I, I have to say, and it's probably, you know, from the perspective of the Southern Harvey Law Center and, and our work in tracking this hate, as, as, as we kind of push to continue to empower ourselves and break free of white supremacy, they're tightening their grip. As we saw on January 6th was just, an extension of what we saw in Charlottesville in 2017. And so I would say that people need to pay attention to that, that the, the rise of white nationalism is going to continue to push back against um, a multicultural democracy and certainly against the, against kind of black folks having any kind of rights. And that is real. And however it's painted, if it's painted as QAnon, if it's painted as, as conservative, this is a rise of a white nationalist movement that feels threatened by the shifting demographics and they will do all that they can to hold on for hold on to power for as long as they can and that's real so that's, that's well i i want to thank all of you leisha brooks Bree newsome cj hunt and i think we have a budding public teaching program uh that could happen and is definitely needed. And thank you so much for this conversation and for your time and for talking honestly about how we deal with and face white supremacy. Thank you so much. Thank you.